I want to just talk about, obviously, the title of this is Filling in the Holes, Challenges of Vein Care for the Interventional Radiologist. And uh, this is not for you to think that interventional radiologists are the only ones that um, have to fill in the holes. But we want to talk about what do you think in terms of either your training or your practice style or IR practice style and training that you may be positive things about treating vein disease and then what are the things that are, are missing, so to speak. And I, I want to divide it into people who are in practice already who then either go into vein disease and, uh, in the middle of their career, so to speak, or and then I want to divide it into those that are in training where are the holes for them versus where are the holes for those people that are already in, um, in practice. So that's kind of the division. And let's talk a little bit uh, first about um, what you guys see as some of the, the holes or challenges or what you needed to fill in when you started to go into vein disease. All of you were already in practice. You didn't get much training uh, you know, as a... Uh, fellow or resident in, um, in vein disease. So, I mean, Carl, can you just give me a, give me an idea? Like, you know, yeah. said, I got these great skill sets, but here's what I, else I need to fill in. Yeah. Thanks Steve. I think from my own perspective, my training gave me a lot of experience and confidence from a technical perspective. And that included imaging, understanding anatomy and skill set with, and all things endovascular with respect to vein disease. You know, you got to deal with uh, deep and superficial. There were probably some limitations in my own personal training on superficial vein disease. It wasn't as heavily emphasized as deep venous disease, um, such as uh, lysing a deep venous thrombosis or placing a filter or opening up an obstruction. So for me, I think the biggest obstacle already having been in practice was basically changing the mindset that I need to be now be responsible for a clinic and that I need to become someone who can provide continuity of care, both pre-procedure and after procedure. I can see someone primarily in consultation. I can formulate a plan and that I can then follow them up and give continuity to the whole picture. That may sound very basic, for someone coming from a vascular surgery background or from another practice background, but for an interventional radiologist, that concept of, of running a clinic and managing a clinic with staff, uh, mid-levels, sonographers, and being responsible for that was a little bit foreign to me. I wouldn't say that it was insurmountable at all. It seemed to be something quite natural, at least for me, to evolve into that side of medicine. But as I look at all the deficiencies and expertise I had and combined that, my main deficiency was on the clinical practice side and making sure that I could provide the same standard of care from pre-procedure to post-procedure that my colleague in vascular surgery would provide. From a training perspective, I'm speculating, but I think it really depends on who our interventional trainee mentors are going to be. Are they being mentored by individuals who, who have a practice, who have a clinic, who see patients in consultation and not just proceduralists? That's really where interventional needs to go. That's where I think it's going to go. Our success really hinges on that long term. Right. So now, Carl, let's just, I, I want to keep the, the training aspect of it out of it for this. I yeah. want, let's, let's first, and we're going to get to that, but I want to get to the, you know, where, where are the holes that people who are, are IRs who are already in practice really need that you think to fill in. Um, John, comments on uh, Carl's thing plus your ideas of what, what you think people going in or who are in practice and want to get involved with vein disease need to fill in, so to speak. Sure. So um, it's interesting. My experience is a little bit different from Carl's. You know, I've been practicing for 25 years and during that time I've done complex peripheral arterial disease with a very robust office-based practice from day one. So actually, my vein practice actually grew as an out, uh, offshoot of the arterial practice, where it became obvious to us that many of these wounds we were treating and many of these patients had venous disease, um, actually as much or not more than arterial disease. So there was a uh, hole to fill in our own practice, um, which obviously we've, uh, we've uh, built up considerably. So we do the full spectrum, both deep and superficial venous uh, disease. 
Uh, I think that has implications for training too. You know, I mean, I tell uh, interventional radiologists who want to get into the peripheral arterial disease market, sort of start from the bottom up. And what I mean from that is, you know, don't try to cherry pick the easy iliac or femoral cases. You know, those are going to be highly competitive. But offer your services for really the more complex, you know, tibiopedal, you know, occlusive disease, critical limb ischemia, uh, really challenging things. And the reason that's relevant to veins is that if you build an arterial practice that way, you'll come across a lot of wounds, a lot of combined arterial and venous insufficiency and naturally, you know, migrate into a vein practice. So can you comment a little bit? I mean, you started out right away in terms of a kind of, quote, office-based or a, a type of practice, but um, that is not the typical route that IRs go. And, you know, I mean, you started from the beginning. What are the things they, they maybe can learn from your experience already that from day one, boom, here's what I really need, need to do in terms of it changing from a hospital-based, you know, consult, see the patient, do the procedure, and boom, the uh, internist or whatever is going to do the follow-up versus right. what, what, you, what you set up. Well, there are several routes you could take. So one is you go traditional diagnostic route where you do some interventional, and you make a good case and a good business plan around getting the time you need for office hours and to do uh, vein procedures, preferably in an uh, outpatient setting. That's very challenging because diagnostic groups, you know, uh, also are strained and uh, kind of need the extra workforce. The other group is you can join somebody, you know, like, you know, the people on this call who already have established practices and kind of, you know, get experience that way. You know, we have a new associate who came on and already we have him in the office and he's doing quite a few vein procedures. Um, so he's going to organically sort of come into this. And the third thing is, you know, to uh, get your experience working for a VCA or, you know, working for a Presenius or something like that, where there is established infrastructure, uh, if that's where your uh, interests lie. You know, each of these paths reflects the most difficult to the easiest, but also reflects the greatest potential upside through to the least. Yeah. All right. Good. Mel. Yes. Give us, well, yes. What do you mean? Tell me, I mean, you, you've been in, in your own practice for God knows how long. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you left, you, you went from Yale and then you decided to start your own place. Right. Um, any variations on the themes that you heard from uh, Carl or John? Uh, a slight. Uh, so all of the points that were made just previously are all valid and good points. Uh, it's interesting. I started my vein practice, and that's my nice, superficial vein practice, as well as a deep, in a university setting, in a hospital setting. And at that time, the reimbursements were favorable to do so. When the reimbursements shifted, uh, they forced a lot of the physicians to exit the hospital and to go into outpatients environment. Now, many radiology practices don't have that established. And um, that is, as uh, Carl has said, a bit of a foreign element to them. It's not something that they're comfortable with, whereas a lot of other specialists might feel very comfortable creating outpatient environments where they can do minor or, or moderate procedures. Uh, so starting out in the hospital environment, um, I had a transition to the outpatient environment, and I did so. Uh, we were always very clinically focused at Yale, so we always had a clinic, uh, but establishing something that's completely disconnected from the hospital is a lot more challenging for the average interventional radiologist. And I think that when we just reflect on what holes are or what gaps exist for radiologists, that's probably the biggest, in my opinion. Uh, those radiologists who are working for large radiology groups or university practices you know, may not have the infrastructure to go out and do procedures outside of their hospital-based environment. They may even have outpatient imaging centers, but those imaging centers are not geared for doing procedures, um, and they don't have the nursing infrastructure as well as the ancillary staff infrastructure, infrastructure to do that because all of that is existing in the hospital, and it's very difficult for them to know how to take it out of the hospital. So. For example, at Yale, when I was there, we were doing a lot of superficial venous procedures. And since I left many years ago, and they have no outpatient facility, and most of that stuff is no longer being done in the hospital. In which case, I got a call recently from one of the fellows who said, where can I get training on venous disease? So clearly that tells me that a program that once was very rich in venous disease therapies is now very weak in superficial venous disease, primarily because of that one issue. All right, so now we get a little bit into training the 
you know, people who are already in training. I mean, what, let me ask you guys, what percentage of all the IR training programs, what percentage do you think have a kind of a, a good experience in uh, treating venous disease? And I want to be specific. In, I think in deep venous disease, I don't think that's an issue. A little bit more about the superficial disease. What, what percentage do you think uh, of training programs, the guys who finish say, gee, I can start day one, I know how to manage you know, superficial disease? John? Well, um, you know, day one sort of coming out to do this, I think you're sort of going to have to, again, find some sort of mentor and somebody with whom you could work and uh, go out and get the appropriate training. Obviously, the companies are very good at uh, providing this. And something else which we didn't mention is that, you know, if you're uh, in an environment where they'll give you the resources and time, you'll also find that these companies will go out and help you do some marketing, some practice development. We shouldn't, you know, give up the idea that you need to kind of give the grand rounds and you need to, you know, go out and give the community talks. And uh, sort of working that way, I think you get a combination of the skill set and the access. So. All right. Carl, do you, you, don't have, you do not have a training program where you are, right? No, we don't have a training program. So I, I would be speculating, Steve, on the percentage of current trainees that are actually getting sufficient superficial experience to step right into practice and do the procedures. But I would say that it's a, it's a lower percentage. I agree with you that deep venous is probably covered. But I think with superficial venous disease, and, and I would expand that. I don't want to really, I think you have to really be broad in your scope about how you approach vein disease if you're going to do it right. That you have to understand everything from coagulopathies and coagulation, how you're going to manage people from a medical point of view, and interface with an interdisciplinary group of, of like-minded individuals, whether it's a, a wound care clinic, certain cases um, you may be collaborating with a vascular surgeon or an internist. There's a group of people that are going to work together. And I think that in and of itself is a skill set. You have to think outward of how you're going to tie the expertise in your community together to get vast outcomes. So I think there's a, a global deficiency, I would say, in comprehensive vein care. And, and I think it goes beyond just interventional, but certainly since the focus is on interventional rheology, I would say that yes, we share some of the limitations of, of a, what a lot of practitioners in this area might have. And some of them are gonna lack you know, things that we have. But, but it, I guess the bottom line is, I think unfortunately, a smaller percentage than is optimal are coming out fully trained in vein disease comprehensively. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's kind of, I mean, my impression of it for almost uh, everybody. Uh, I mean, Mel, no, I, I, the, tra I the trainees, Mel. I think there's a direct correlation between a training program and its access to an outpatient vein center or vascular center and the degree of experience the fellows get. And if you look at Cornell, for example, uh, the fellows have an opportunity. Uh, they have an outpatient facility on the west side of Manhattan. I don't know how often they get out there. Dr. Kilnani could speak more to that. He's not on the call. But... Uh, that program at least has that opportunity. Unfortunately, there may be programs out there that don't have that opportunity, and I would venture to guess that in those programs, the fellows and trainees don't get the experience in superficial venous disease to any significant degree. Um, they certainly get the deep vein stuff because that is part and part of their right. basic vein and hospital activities. Now, let me ask you, so what do you think SIR's role is in, in this whole filling in the gaps kind of thing. Well, you know, if you're asking me, it's, it's yes, so, no. SIR's role, almost like the ACP roles and the American Venus Forum's role, is to provide training. So there is a didactic component to this besides the experiential component. And those societies are there to educate. That's one of their primary goals. And so they're trying to educate those who want to learn about venous disease, both superficial and deep, and they can provide that. What they can't provide, which is something that is, is the hands-on aspect, which is the, the ability to actually do cases and to do the punctures and to do what needs to be done and to do sclerotherapy. As we all know, sclerotherapy is an art form. And while you may be able to interact with a plastic trainer model, it's not the same as doing it and, and, and understanding the complications and outcomes and what concentrations to use and, and, and the like. And that comes with experience 
uh, watching physicians doing it who know what they're doing and having the opportunity to do it yourself. So there is no question that a didactic experience is certainly available to them, but that experiential component is certainly lacking. So, so you know, I, I mean, I would kind of semi-disagree with you. I mean, I think if anyone has good technical skill sets in terms of training nowadays, it's both IR, uh, you know, trainees and now vascular trainees because of all the endovascular stuff. So while I agree with you, sclerotherapy in and of itself can be a difficult procedure because, you know, you're talking about little veins, an awake patient with high expectations uh, versus, you know, taking care of an iliac uh, compression syndrome, big veins, not a problem. But I personally think IR, from a skill technical viewpoint, probably has the best skill sets. And in general, these vein procedures are not that hard technically. It's more the what should I do when kind of thing. It's more that cognitive thing that, that is the issue. So if I can put my two cents in not being an IR, I think you guys are, in terms of technical skills, are way ahead in terms of almost all the other subspecialties that that treat venous disease. No, I, I, I don't mean to talk to you, but I certainly agree with you. For example, uh, certainly the use of ultrasound and ultrasound guidance, which is right. part and parcel of, of, of venous procedures, is, is something that IR fellows have a lot of exposure to. So you're absolutely correct when you say that the raw talent is there and the skill sets are certainly things that can carry over. Right. Uh, the question you're I'm certainly getting, right. I mean, the decision making is such a big part of it, you know, right? And you get that at SIR, or you can get those at dedicated vein courses. Obviously, you're at, you know, Viva this year, you know, runs the, runs the vein course with Ragu Kalori. And, you know, I think the skill set is there. You're absolutely right. But, um, you know, there is a very, very large part about, um, you know, making the right decisions and performing the right surveillance and follow up and, uh, you know, counseling patients regarding the right expectations. And I think we all know that if you're, in, certainly if you're in, venous insufficiency and varicose veins, handling the expectations, knowing, you know, the sort of adverse events and how to deal with those is as large a part of this as the actual skill set. Right. And I, th and I think that's, that's something that um, people outside of the IR world and vascular world, maybe, they, they think that you're basically, you're proceduralist and not cognitive, you know, uh, how can I how can I solve the the problem? Everything's working. Everything. Can you hear us, Mark? Yeah, thank you. Okay, Mark can hear us. All right, so you can. Well, you're just going to have to join the conversation here, Mark. That's so, fine. So, John, I I, I want to ask you what what is your answer to people who say, well, uh, you know, the IR guys and the and the vascular guys, they're just doing a procedure because they can do a procedure and they're not thinking as much as, as we're thinking because we come from a, a di we're not a proceduralist type of people. We're a cognitive, you know, what does the patient want kind of thing. And, and it, it, is, that a, is that a fair thing? Because the perception out there is that, listen, IRs, I mean, you guys are, you know, the, honestly, people say, oh, they're just cowboys. They'll stick a needle into anything, whether it's a vessel or, or anything else. And, and I think that's not a correct way of thinking of, of IRs at all. But um, do you feel there are people that are doing procedures just because they can do them rather than thinking, I'm talking about IRs, rather than thinking about is this the right thing to do for this particular patient? So I want John, John, you first answer that and then we'll go to others. You know, Steve, you, know, you could always get individuals in any specialty, in any domain who will kind of abuse their privileges and, you know, perform things for the, uh, uh, not necessarily the best reasons. You know, I know one IR, not to be named, when every patient does bilateral stage greater saphenous and lesser saphenous vein ablation, every single patient. Now, you know, uh, that may be necessary, but clearly individuals like that don't still have the right motivations. But, you know, cream floats. At the end of the day, if you recognize the responsibility you have, and if you embrace the emerging data, which has really very much changed the way we uh, focus on vein disease, then, uh, you know, you're going to be a responsible practitioner and you need to be. You know, in the old days, maybe there was a merit to just sort of putting needles into fixing them. You know, we didn't know the outcomes uh, and the, uh, uh, we didn't have the science behind it. But now we have a lot of science and, a, you know, a really a growing, much more robust scientific base regarding both, you know, treatment of DVT and superficial disease, right? A tract is going to be reported next year and 
that's a landmark trial. So, you know, I think that to answer your point directly, you need to be responsible. You need to know all facets of the science as well as the technique. And that's going to be the new evolution. All right. So, Mark, now that you have joined us, uh, we've been talking about you continuously during the entire conversation. So, everybody, don't say anything bad about Mark anymore. <laughs> now that he's on the line. Enough of that, right? <clears throat> no, I want to ask you a little bit because uh, the other guys kind of chimed in. The thoughts about training uh, the people that are coming up and, and what you think are the important points that an IR fellow or trainee needs to take away when they're going to treat vein disease. Is it a procedural technical aspect? Is it is more of a cognitive, you know, understanding disease aspect? Or, I mean, where do you think a, they, they uh, shine and where do you think there are some deficiencies? Um, that's a great question. I think um, to in, to, to summarize, um, I, I really think that our biggest problem is up to now, and I don't think, I think we've done a good job, but I think we still have a long way to go, is to, to educate IRs to be clinicians. And the problem is that unless you come from the primary pathway, sort of uh, the, the um, pathways that were much more clinically oriented, when you come to the diagnostic pathway that most of us all here tonight have, you really had to take it upon yourself to be engaged as a clinician. And I think that's the hardest part of, of our subspecialty. And I think the other subspecialties, um, it's innate that they learn that. Um, but for us, it's not because, you know, diagnostic radiology, it's not a hands-on patient-to-patient -patient contact every day. It's only an IR that you get most of that. So I think as we educate people coming up to be clinicians, they learn the science, they learn the data, they, they get more engaged in, in hopefully doing clinical trials and understanding what it, what it really is all about. And it kind of goes into what your, your, your uh, question to John is. I, I think that, that when we truly understand the disease um, from the top down, that we can all do a better job. And hopefully, um, like most of all our colleagues on tonight, we don't believe it's all about you know, uh, patting the pocket and the wallet. It's really, truly about taking care of the patient and doing the right thing. So I think it starts with education, and hopefully people will be in programs that they, they treat patients um, as they need to be, you know, and we as clinicians um, learning learning the, the, the disease and, and all the processes behind them. Steve, one, this is Carl, I just have one quick comment to add on to that, that I think part of the evolution also that I have seen with, with SIR and, and with those who treat vein disease generally is I think – as a group, we're becoming much more interdisciplinary. And Steve, to your credit, I think you have facilitated that. I've known you for uh, a lot of years, and you have been at the forefront, I think, of bringing a lot of specialists together to have this dialogue. Because frankly, if I look at uh, some disease processes like lymphatics that overlap into vein disease, I know relatively little about lymphatics, but have been forced to learn more and become more aware. Same perhaps with wound care. Um, and I think that that is, the, is really another critical evolution that we need to become better at uh, interacting with other specialists and feel comfortable with that because we have a lot to learn from them and they can hopefully learn something from us. Yeah, and I, and I think, well, thank you, Carl, for what you said, but I, I think that is a, a very good point. We, we all bring to the management of vein disease our own subset of, uh, you know, what we're good at and, and what we're not good at. And the collaboration is probably a, a good thing uh, for us and, and obviously, you know, for, for patients uh, as well. Um, but our goal should be that if an IR person wants to treat vein disease or if a vascular person wants to treat vein disease, that they should almost have 95% of the skill sets to treat vein disease. And those those very specific areas that maybe vascular has a little bit more or IR has a little bit more. But I think our goal personally, we should always collaborate, but yet anyone who's treating vein disease should really be able to treat the big, big spectrum of vein disease. And if they're not going to do it, they should get somebody in, into their practice that, that, that does do it. What, what I want to know uh, what, to help our, our readers out and, and everything else is a young IR guy says, hey, I want to get involved with, uh, with vein disease. 
Now, all of us on this call, honestly, none of us are working at a big academic center. Neil's not on the call. He, he would have been the one that was. But yet, I think any of us could, and some of us did, work at big academic centers. But I think it's almost, there is a reason why many of us who are dealing with vein disease and, and you know, talk and, uh, about vein disease is because of what you guys have brought up, which is not the procedural aspect of it, but the ability to relate to patients and treat them from, as Carl, you started in the beginning, when you first see them, doing the procedure, and, and afterwards as well. And where in that paradigm do the trainees learn this? I mean, because I don't think they're going to learn it during their academic career when they're being trained. You know, the, this is Mel, Steve. Um, you know, it depends on the program. Um, when I was at Hopkins, when I was at Yale, we had very clinically active programs, you know, thanks to, to Bob White, who was first at Hopkins and then at Yale. So there were a lot of the early IR physicians who really strongly believed that having a, a direct patient interaction, not just a referral patient, do a procedure and never see them again approach, uh, was something very beneficial. Now, clearly programs don't follow that modality, uh, but we're talking about fellowship training programs, and many of the fellowship programs that I'm aware of do kind of have that approach, at least in the IR programs that I'm aware of. During the diagnostic radiology portion of their uh, residencies, that's probably where they lack that experience. Uh, so they, they don't get it as, let's say, a vascular surgeon would get during their five years of residency training. Uh, and so their fellowship that they get it. Uh, so... Um, Clearly, there is a slight disadvantage, but most of the IR fellows do have some clinical background and, you know, have the opportunity to go to the clinic, maybe not as much as other specialties for sure, but it is there in most programs. Um, you know, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, which wasn't touched upon, which is the, um, if there was some allusion to the fact that maybe physicians uh, might be doing things in a routine fashion, kind of doing a, you know, Basically, if they have a hammer, everything's a nail. And I think it's a diagnostic element that we, we might be um, neglecting to talk about. The ultrasound diagno diagnosis of, of, of superficial venous disease is critical and guides therapy and everything. And, and in some programs, uh, when, they're, when the ultrasound department is somewhat separated from, let's say, the IR training program, I think that one of the deficiencies that maybe interventional radiology fellows, fellows have is that they don't really have a good experience with making the appropriate diagnosis. And I've seen some young IR fellows come out of practice, and while they know how to do procedures very well, and they know how to see patients in the clinic, there's still, there's still a, an educational gap of how to really evaluate a patient with an ultrasound machine and understand what it is they have to do. Hey, Steve, just if I could make a, another comment. Um, I think, though, one of the issues that we all are going to face going forward, uh, speaking on people that do things maybe uh, unnecessarily or, or in, in, a, in a way that uh, would be looked upon by most of us as, you know, questionable. You know, I, you were at the MedCAC uh, meeting this past summer, right? Yeah. Were, were you there? No, no, I wasn't there. But. Okay. Well, the one thing that's clear is that, you know, CMS, Medicare, they're aware of the, and you saw at the AVF, the numbers that have increased um, are astronomical of people doing vein procedures. There's got to be some oversight. You know, I'm, at least ASCs, you know, have an oversight. The hospitals have JCO, they have an oversight. There's going to be some need for oversight in the OBL world. Um, that's just coming. It's going to have to happen. And rather than we being told that we have to do that, somehow we, as, and, and going back to the collaborative uh, model, we ought to partner together in our societies and figure out what these should be and be very strong about it. Um, and I think be very opinionated about it, doing the right thing for the patient, because otherwise we're going to be stuck in a situation where we're not going to have any control. Right. You know, we're going to get, we're going to be taken to the, to the, to the cleaners because of the abuse that's going on. So people better wise up uh, and, and start to, play the game a little bit cleaner, I think. So let me ask you guys, I agree with you, Mark. Let, let me ask you guys this. I'm going to change it a little bit. So typically in a, in a vascular practice, the new hire, so to speak, is the one that they say, okay, you're going to be the vein person, if they don't already have a vein person, because, you know, veins in the vascular world 
until recently is kind of like the the low end of the spectrum. They said, okay, you the, the new guy comes out. Is this the same type of thing in the IR world when you would take on another partner? Do you say to them, now you're you're going to be the uh, the person doing veins in our practice, and, and we're going to take care of the complex, you know, arterial issues, or is it thought of differently at this point? John, you seem to be on the you're on the screen for some reason, so go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think the truth is, uh, well, the easy way is to bring in a junior associate and let him do the things you don't want to do. Uh, the better way is to bring them in and have them do everything you do. You know, obviously sort of starting slow, uh, working with them, watching how they approach disease, discussing cases. But, you know, to immediately integrate them into a practice where they're doing both venous and arterial disease, if that's part of your practice. That's hard. That's a challenge. You know, that takes, you know, uh, uh, some good, mature partners we're sort of comfortable in what they do and comfortable relinquishing some relationships they built with referring docs to somebody who is new and, um, you know, potentially will struggle through some initial cases. But it's the right way. It's important. So we build a broad, you know, foundation for the future. Yeah, no, I think so. So, Carl, what, who, it, have you brought on some younger guys recently, Carl, at all to your practice? Well, we, we brought on several in the last, uh, you know, six or seven years. And we follow the pattern just like John does. I think that if you relegate someone to some category, at least the way we practice, we want to be a 24-7 service where all of us provide, hopefully, a very uniform standard of care. And it won't matter to a large degree who's on, whether they, they happen to be on the vein service or the inpatient service. The, the standard of care and the spectrum of of diseases they can treat and manage is the same. And so we have never carved somebody out and, and said, you're our vein guy or you're our trail guy. Some people will have an affinity towards perhaps uh, interventional oncology, or maybe they do have a particular interest in more complex arterial cases, but it tends to be self selection. But for the core offering, we try to be on a fairly equal playing level and give everybody equal experience. So with the junior partners, it's a matter of making sure they're, they're all having the same rotation experience that, that we are. And that's how basically we distribute our schedule. We, we pretty much get the same spectrum of opportunity, all of us. Part, part of the reason I think that that occurs also is that many IR programs, particularly most of where we all came from, even though we're starting to branch out and do the OBL, the, out, the office based labs and such, most of the IR programs still practice in the hospital. It's very difficult to bring on a young guy who may be in a level one trauma center and they don't know how to do certain procedures when they're on call. And you can't really have that. So you have to have like everybody learn everything that's going on in that practice. So that also is, is part of, of why people don't necessarily specialize. Towards the end of when I left Christiana, one thing that we were doing was people were going to be, people started taking the lead point in certain diseases, arterial disease, oncology, and so on. But that didn't mean that everybody else was left out. It was just somebody that was really going to be sort of the head to interact and collaborate with the other uh, subspecialties to try to drive that practice. But other than that, everybody still had to perform so they could do it when they were on call. All right. So where, from all of you, if you had to give uh somebody who's either in practice or, or just finishing practice, and they say to, say to you, I want to learn about vein disease. I want to get a, a good experience. Give me two or three meetings or uh, experiences that they, key things that they should say, I got to do this and I got to do this. And when I finish doing these two or three things, I'm going to have a pretty good idea about how to manage venous disease. And you can be uh, biased or unbiased. You can say, go to this meeting, go to this meeting, go to this meeting. But I want to give our readers a little bit of when they're looking at this, okay, yeah, I'm doing a little bit of veins, but I, I need more. So what are, give me two or three key experiences they should check off in the next year or two. Um, and again, you can, you can be biased. It's just, it's fine with me. You know, we're all big, big boys here. Well, I'm, go it's ahead, I'm happy to chime in from that one. I just had that question asked to me today, interestingly enough, and had an opportunity to think about that. I personally think, and, and this is a recommendation I made, is that the first thing they should do is take a basic review course. The ACP has a, uh, 
a day before their meeting where you have a basic phlebology where they review the basic stuff. And then, of course, they can go on to advanced stuff. And there are other courses out there, it certainly doesn't have to be the ACP, that have a full day or a full period of time where they review the entire elements, uh, uh, at least in superficial venous disease. And that's probably step one. Step two, in my opinion, would be if they had the opportunity to go maybe to, uh, uh, to, to act as a volunteer in South America where they have the opportunity to treat maybe hundreds of patients who are in need, do something charitable at the same time getting a tremendous education. And I think that would probably be an invaluable experience in hands-on and learning some of something about the disease, um, you know, in an environment where, you know, making the correct decision is not about money, but it's about taking care of the patient. So if there were two, two activities that I would recommend, I would recommend a basic training course, get as much as you can, maybe some advanced, and then try to spend, you know, a week on one of these charitable missions to South America to get some hands-on training. Interesting. I never thought of that, the charitable missions to get uh, some experience. Um, John, what, what, give us a couple of things they should do. Well, I mean, uh, certainly American College of Phlebology runs a good course, and uh, you know, that's a, a very robust uh, you know, and full uh, curriculum. Uh, you know, I'm you know, partial to a Google uh, Calories course at Viva every year. That Veins course is fabulous, and you can stay on for the extra day and get exposure to some of the complex arterial stuff and live cases, so it makes it a little bit more uh, rounded. And, of course, if you're in uh, the tri-state area, this guy Steve Elias runs a course, um, <laughs> and you go to his shop, and he'll sort of give you some hands-on stuff as well. And, you know, my, my junior partner came out and did some work with you with Trivex and learned a great deal. So if you have that resource, whether it be you, Steve Elias, or somebody else in the community that you – and uh, approach who's doing this sort of work and ask if you come in and watch and do some cases, I think that's probably a very good thing to do. Yeah, well, that's a good, but thank you. That, I, but I do agree, somebody like that is that's a good experience. Carl. Yeah, I, I wanna echo what John and Mel have said, and I can speak firsthand on the humanitarian mission. I've gone to Honduras with the Hackett Hillmill Foundation for seven years, and that's been a tremendous experience. You see a wide spectrum of pathology there. The, the worst of the worst in terms of, of venous stasis ulcerations. And it's a tremendous experience all the way around. So I, I would fully support that as an educational and a service opportunity combined. The other thing I would add to this that has really opened my eyes has been the ABVLM. And I know it's in its infancy, but the idea is where you take a group of, of like-minded professionals and you try to establish a a content, a spectrum of content that we all need to understand. And it gets back to what you were saying, Steve, that if we're going to be in this business, we need to be able to all treat the 95 percentile of everything. There may be some outliers where we refer out. But one of the things that I think is getting closer and closer to drawing some uniformity in, in what we all need to understand are the efforts of the uh, American Board of uh, Lymphatic and Venous Medicine because if you prepare for that exam and you take that, you are learning a ton of content. And I think that would be a nice, perhaps third or fourth element to what we're talking about that would round out an interventional radiologist's experience as they enter into this field. Yeah, okay, all right, good. So we're gonna just finish up in the next uh, two or three minutes, but Mark, give us your, your thoughts about this and then I'll, I'll do some little summary and stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, basically what's been stated is 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 fair game for. I, I think you have to decide honestly. Um, you, we've talked a lot about and heard a lot about superficial disease. I think there's a lot of chronic venous disease work that has to be done. Um, I actually think the AVF is probably what turned it around for me. I think the American Venus Forum has been fantastic. It's a very scientific meeting, and I've learned probably more science about it from you and your colleagues than I've I've ever learned before. So. And I think the idea of doing mini fellowship type of, uh, of training where you can go to places um, that John was talking about, like going with you, uh, we've, we've worked a lot together. There's just a tremendous amount to learn on that one-on-one -on -one or smaller group um, conference like or mini tr fellowship uh, training that, that's, that's uh, invaluable. Yeah. All right. Good. All right, guys. So I think, I mean, I think we've, you know, come to some ideas and conclusions that people can take something away from this if they want to fill in their the holes and, and the holes it doesn't necessarily just have to be IR holes it can be anybody almost uh, who wants to get involved with uh, with vein disease 
And so I thank you all. And um, I think we're done.